Uh, Mr. Jason Wong, thank you so much for joining me, mate. Uh, from your, your home in Sydney, I'm in Melbourne. Um, we're touching base on Zoom as, as the world does these days. How are you? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, just at home in the home office. Uh, pretty nice day today, so uh, not too bad to be working from home. Living the Sydney life. So talk to me. Um, we've, we're lucky to have your story, which we've got under a different name. We might have to update that on the Betfair Hub anonymously. Um, we, we, um, re I'm really interested in rehearing your story and getting a bit more detail out of you. I, I think it's, it's such a fascinating journey into punting from completely unrelated discipline and background. Um, so talk to me about it. You were working at the bank. Were you, were you doing quant stuff um, at the bank back then? Yeah, so I started, um, so I did an um, a undergraduate in actuarial studies a um, very long time ago. Then I started working at, um, working at the bank. So I started at Westpac and went to CBA. Did that for about 10 years. So working in the quant division. So uh, the team I'm working in were kind of like building models to price risk uh, for the bank. Um, so think about a bank, um, the main way they make money is to, to make loans, but um, obviously, the riskier the loans are, um, the less that they want to take on unless the reward is commensurate with that. So our job was to make sure that we're taking on the, the right amount of reward uh, for the risk we're taking in our loans. Um, Sounded so like the US good. economy needed you about 20 years ago. What's that? I, I've just watched The Big Short again, and it sounded like the US economy needed you about 20 years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or maybe they needed less of me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so you started pretty young. Had you even finished uni by the time you were sort of working in the banks, if, if you were doing a decade of that? Yeah, no. I, um, so came straight out of uni, got a grad job, Westpac for eight years, CBA for two, and then, um, yeah, then kind of left that all behind, and uh, here we are. I'm, I'm really curious is sort of the correlation between doing the stuff for the bank and the punting, but um, how did the punting start? Yeah, that's, a, that's interesting because um, I had, I guess I knew nothing about punting. I never put a bet on um, up to about maybe four or five years ago. Um, I wasn't really too much into um, even like sport or AFL back then. So AFL is what got me into um, sports punting. Um, it was really just a conversation I was having with a mate in my team. Um, he had a, had a set of AFL data, which was pretty, uh, pretty rudimentary back then, only team level stuff. And then he said, you know, I think um, this is a good chance for us to make money. Uh, we started modeling it. It was pretty soft back then. And then it kind of just went from there. And like we started punting pretty small state. They got pretty, they got pretty big uh, pretty quickly um, because we were getting a pretty high ROI on AFL. And that kind of just, uh, I guess, opened that world into, um, into kind of making money from this kind of thing. I think there's a big stigma on, on sports betting when everyone's, a lot of people think that everyone's uh, doing sports betting the mug, no one can make money off it. And I, I, you know, to be honest, thought like that as well before that, but that kind of opened my eyes into thinking that you know, there's nothing different to this than share trading. No one can make money share trading. Sports betting is actually um, probably, probably a bit easier because there's less um, big professionals doing it. So um, there's more for the little guy to take. Yeah, right. And... Um, do, do you find it still soft now or has it got much trickier in the last couple of years? Um, I think it's gotten a lot, a lot tougher, especially with the sports that I used to do. So AFL, NRL, I think I've gotten a lot tougher, um, probably just because um, a lot of the biggest syndicates have started playing in it. Um, I, think, I think racing, um, so I started getting into greyhound racing pretty, pretty recently. I think that's still um, relatively soft, um, but... There's, there's not liquidity there they have one that, that has on you know obviously on reds and other sports as well yeah and then so just going back in terms of the afl stuff um like how long were you back testing models and and how long were you working on it to to sort of find the roi and then say hey i'm going to have my first bet and then you know obviously the, the stakes increased as you became more successful and identified how big your edge was talk talk to me about just those first few bets that you were placing yeah, I mean, the, the first model that we built was, was basically a modified ELO. Um, very simple, probably took us about two days to do. And since we are betting such small stakes, it was more like a hobby thing, so we weren't too concerned with backtesting the, you know, back the hell out of it to make sure that it was, it was right. You know, I was sure that 
we made some kind of error in there where we're using future data to protect past data. Um, but it, I mean, it turned out to be good. So we just started punting on it with, um, you know, hundred dollars stakes um, for the first season. And then once we um, started getting a bit of a bankroll together, um, the stakes increased pretty quickly. Um, and I think, I think it was, it was only about maybe, um, I think it was a pretty big step change with AFL that four or five years ago, everyone was using team models. Um, player models weren't that popular back then. Um, I don't think the data was as good as it is today. Um, so it was a pretty big step, step change from two or three years ago, uh, where the markets got pretty sharp pretty quickly um, and just team models didn't cut it anymore. Um, and I wow. guess that's when um, I decided that, you know, if I wanted to do this seriously, you can't, you can't just model one small Australian sport and hope to, hope to you know, eat out that and, and come out of that. Yeah. And then, so you're doing this while still at the bank, I assume it's just a, it's a passion hobby that you're monitoring week to week with the hundred bucks, what just betting on the line. And then after the end of the season, you say, Hey, we've won it 15% here. Um, Let's see if we can just crank this up a little bit, make the model tighter and um, get better and then bet more. Is that what happened? Yeah, I think it was, it was good back then as we're betting on the lines and totals. So lines all have all had pretty good liquidity. Uh, totals is the one where it's probably, you know, unless you're betting only like 100, 200 bucks, you probably can't get that much on without moving it. Um, so luckily back then our stakes were pretty small. So totals were very good back then. You know, we we're winning at about... Uh, 65, 70% against Total's line, which is just, you know, unheard of um, on, on any other sport. Um, but obviously, when, once we started increasing our stakes, it was just impossible to get on. Um, yeah. Handicap, you know, handicap was a lot a lot uh, sharper, um, but we were able to get more money on. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the handicap was still pretty good back then, um, but it, it quickly sharpened up. I think Total's is still... Totals is still pretty close. I don't think the bookies really care too much about modeling totals uh, just because they haven't had on for that much. So their exposure on that is pretty low. Can you still get on totals, you know, three or four years later now or is it um, impossible to get fresh accounts because it's not a straight I guess you, it's not really worth it now given um, given the, the stakes I'm betting. You know, betting to win $100 or $200 just isn't, isn't worth the time. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of effort in terms of managing all that stuff. Um and then what, when did you add sort of NFL to, to the book and then, you know, look into more sports? Yeah, um, NRL was, I guess, the easy one just because of the showing sport as well. Use a, uh, a similar approach to model it. Um, so that was, I guess, a, um, a no-brainer to add, add to the suite of sports I was modeling. Um, tried to dip my hand into tennis a bit. Um, put a lot of effort into it. Um, was eking out maybe you know two or three percent against pinnacle closing the pinnacle closing line. Um, just found out that it wasn't really worth the time. Probably spent too much time on it in hindsight, um, thinking I could beat it, but you know tennis very efficient. Um, so I tried my hand at a lot of sports, and I think one of the lessons that I would have um, uh, you know taken. Um, from that and wouldn't do, do differently if I had my time again. It's just trying not to model so many sports. And once I got into this full time, I thought, you know, I can I can beat any, everything. And I like went into it thinking, model every sport, sit back, just watch the computer, spit out outcomes or what goes to bed, work two hours a day and I'm sweet. And then obviously it doesn't work that way. The four hour work week. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the two hour work yeah. week. <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, that, that that doesn't surprise me too much. Tennis is such a liquid market, um, and uh, you know, globally, there's so many events. So, um, talk to me about the difference between NRL and AFL. I've, like previously, I've heard that NRL, given it's a it's a lower scoring sport than AFL, makes it a little bit more challenging to to not only trade but to also model. Do you find that to be the case, or not really? Um, I think the the lower scoring thing. Um, I think it does probably add a bit more variance to your results, um, but I didn't find it too much of an issue. The, the biggest difference I uh, I found between NRL and AFL was just um, the player importance. So I think for AFL, you could get away, you know, five years ago with just building a team model and um, making money. 
I'm not sure that would have worked with NRL just because um, if a key player is out in NRL, that's going to make a big, much bigger difference than in an AFL. With AFL, there's, um, there's, they usually have pretty good depth and um, because there's so many players on the field, uh, one player, unless it's a superstar, probably isn't going to make that big a difference. It make a difference, but if you had a, you know, a gun fullback like Tedesco or, um, you know, or Ponger out, um, who really is, is the key to the team, that's going to make a huge difference in an NRL compared to AFL. Yeah. And then, so with your AFL punting, it, it, do you do the team model and a play model and just sort of overlay? And then when they're, you know, when they're both showing the same thing um, and there's an edge versus the market, is that when you step into them? Yeah, I used to do that. So I used to use kind of like an ensemble model, use both of them, um, both spit out outcomes. Um, kind of canned that a few years ago, um, just because it was too complicated. Um, and I, I found myself probably putting a bit much, too much qualitative overlay on top of the results. Um, so now it's just punching off the, the player model, which is the one that's producing um, the better results anyway. Yeah, okay. And then how have you found that over the last couple of years? Obviously, there's been some rule changes in the AFL. And then at the moment, we're in this COVID climate where they've you know, shortened quarters and there's hubs and there's all these other different sort of variables that are new. How do you find, do, do you bet more cautiously in this environment or um, does the model, you know, is the model still strong enough to, to keep betting up? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty good point. It's probably a, a couple of things. I, I definitely bet a lot, um, a lot less in AFL, um, probably for a couple of reasons. One is, like you said, there's a, it's a bit of a, a new environment that we're in that we've never seen before, no fans, short quarters. Um, there's been, you know, some rule changes over the last couple of years, um, but also last year was my first losing year in AFL. Um, so it's made me be a bit more cautious, you know, maybe the edge has gone, you know, I'm, I'm happy to admit that, you know, the edge um, has dwindled and I shouldn't be betting as much as I did on it. But it's, it's one of those tough things with AFL, um, basically any sport with a, a pretty short season. You know, AFL and NRL only have 200 odd games a season. If you have a losing year, you don't, I mean, you can do tests, to, um, statistical tests, to, um, get a feeling on whether it was just variance or whether you've lost your edge, but it's hard to know for sure because you just don't have that much of a sample. If you're for 200 games a season, you're betting on maybe half of them. You could have a 15% ROI model that just had a year, um, or you could have, you know, conversely had a um, really good year, but you could have had a losing model with just variance. So that's, that's one of the things that, like, um, I guess, betting on these short season sports, it's a big disadvantage is that you can't really know when your edge is gone for certain. And then so looking at that now, you just can't quite work it out. Like, did, well, how does that impact your behaviour now? Is it just I've got the same model but I'm going to, you know, reduce my stakes a little bit or do you do some tweaking in the off-season to say, hey, these are some changes I want to implement? Yeah, I've done some um, some tweaking, um, some tweaking that I thought just made sense due to which was more qualitative. Um, some tweaking that was a bit more quantitative. I haven't really changed it too much. Um, probably just just betting on. Um, I, I'm betting less games to be honest. Um, before I was pretty confident in the model that I've bet on more marginal positions. I've kind of taken them out. Um, but, but having said that, you know, when I was betting on those more marginal positions, AFL was probably 70, 80% of my portfolio in terms of betting. Um, now it's probably like 10%. So I'm not too concerned if AFL is a losing year now. Okay. Yeah, right. And that's just been accumulated predominantly by the Greyhounds. That's just taken over? Yeah, Greyhounds. So, I mean, I do a, a few things. So... Um, I guess Greyhounds, AFL and NRL are probably my, um, like I like to classify them to two types of models, so fundamental models and, and market-based models. So the fundamental models are where you're actually trying to predict the price, predict um, uh, team A is going to be team B by this much and this probability. Um, so Greyhounds, AFL and NRL constitute them, but then I also have the market models, which is kind of like you don't really care what sport you're betting on. You're just trying to predict trends and movements, take a shift where you think it's value and either hold it or trade out. Um, but it, it, I guess those models, if I don't really care about 
what you're betting on, just as long as there's enough liquidity and enough, enough movement um, that you can make a profit. And so that's all automated. And I've um, gotten a lot more heavy into that just because it tends to be uh, lower risk and uh, more stable, a stable earn than um, fundamental models. Yeah. And do you, um, so it sounds like you're getting in and out and trying to green up um, into liquid markets. With that, is that your banking sort of background coming into it or are you do some sort of inde- independent research in terms of trends and, you know, weight of money moves and stuff like that? Yeah, so my, my banking background is probably more in the uh, more, uh, more useful for the fundamental type models. Um, yeah, to, to do the market-based stuff, it was, it was more my own research, um, just test ideas that that I thought would work. Most of them didn't. Um, but yeah, just just trial and error. Uh, for those ones, it's kind of it's kind of like you, you can't really back test it with that much confidence because you don't know, especially with smaller markets, how much influence you're going to have once you enter. So it's much better to test it live. And if it doesn't work out, um, it's it's pretty quick to see it's not going to work out, and you can it, um, and you move on to the next idea. Um, but yeah, for, for that stuff, back testing I think is a, a bit less important and just testing it live is, is more important. Yeah, okay. Yeah, interesting. And then um, do you use any of those principles to bet into crypto markets or anything different or is it exclusively sort of on the exchange and getting in and out there? Uh, exclusively on the exchange. So I think the bet fair API is really good. Um, it's pretty easy to use. Um, so all my stuff just happens on the exchange. 